The Last Lesson by Alphonse Daudet Alphonse Daudet 1840-1897 was a French poet, novelist and a short story writer. He resorted to creative writing after trying his hand in teaching and journalism. His short stories are beautifully sensitive tales of French countryside. His Les Amiers is the only book of collections of his love poems. This story, last lesson, is taken from Lei Kun Zhu Lundi, written in the year 1873, just after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. What is Franco-Prussian War? Franco-Prussian War or Franco-German War or War of 1870 happened from July 19, 1870 to May 10, 1871, in which the unified German states, led by Prussia, defeated France. Well, what's the cause and effect of this war? The Kingdom of Prussia was constituted and built little by little between 1701 to 1918. This was done for the sake of unifying Germany and to establish its political and administrative supremacy over the countries that surrounded it. The original unification was masterminded by Otto von Bismarck. Remember, we call our Sardar Vallabhai Patel the Bismarck of India for his efforts in unifying the princely states in India. The war marked the end of French domination in Europe. The French territories of Lorraine and Alsace came under this German empire. The story we are going to read and listen is narrated through the eyes of a little boy called Franz, who was one of the occupants of this zone, Lorraine and Alsace, that came under German rule. The moment Germany won these territories, their language was imposed upon the natives. They were forced to abandon their native tongue, French. Have you ever thought of the effects that wars can have on people? Wars destroy communities and families. They destructure the social economic patterns of countries, often leading to losing of ways and means of living. People are afflicted by fear, doubt and revengeful mentality, which change their psyche forever. People as nation are made to allege themselves to where they don't belong. Wars disrupt the peace of children and adults who can never be the same again. Above all, people lose their identity as nation, as linguistic groups, and as unified societies. Well, how can language be considered as our identity? Language is one's own identity undoubtedly. It is such a complex mechanism and fundamental to every culture. It's the mirror that reflects the way we live as societies. We understand everything and anchor them as pictures in our minds through words. The unique bond of language and culture gets disintegrated if one is forced to abandon one's native language. It is said by the experts, the wisdom of humanity is coded in language. Once a language dies, the knowledge of the community dies with it. You know something? The International Mother Language Day is celebrated on 21 February every year. When India and Pakistan were separated, the East Pakistan, adjoining the present-day West Bengal and presently called as Bangladesh, made Urdu their official language. This led to a turmoil resulting in severe clashes and police shooting. Four young college students were martyred. The UNESCO announced this day to be the International Mother Language Day to celebrate the linguistic and cultural idiosyncrasies of people world over. It's reading time now. Before we could read, please take note of the following expressions. As I told you already, this story is written in the first person narrative. We are going to see the incidents through the eyes of a little boy called Franz. Here is the story for you. I started for school very late that morning and was in great dread of a scolding especially because 
M. Hamel had said that he would question us on participles. Participles, as you must be knowing, is a grammatical item. For example, verbs writing and written are participles of the English verb write. Writing is known as the present participle and written is past participle. They act as adjectives and they also have several other grammatical functions. And I did not know the first word about them. Not to know the first word about something is to know nothing. For a moment, I thought of running away and spending the day out of doors. It was so warm, so bright. The birds were chirping at the edge of the woods. And in the open field, back of the sawmill, the Prussian soldiers were drilling. It was all much more tempting than the rule for participles. But I had the strength to resist and hurried off to school. When I passed the town hall, there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board. For the last two years, all our bad news had come from there. The lost battles, the draft, the orders of the commanding officer. And I thought to myself without stopping, what can be the matter now? Then, as I hurried by as fast as I could go, the blacksmith, watcher, who was there with his apprentice, reading the bulletin, called after me. Don't go so fast, Bob. You will get to your school in plenty of time. I thought he was making fun of me and reached M. Amel's little garden all out of breath. Usually, when school began, there was a great bustle. Which could be heard all the, the opening and closing of desks, lessons repeated in unison, very loud with our hands over our ears to understand better, and the teacher's great ruler rapping on the table. But now, it was all so still. I had counted on the commotion to get to my desk without being seen. But of course that day everything had to be as quiet as Sunday morning. Through the window, I saw my classmates already in their places and M. Hamel walking up and down with his terrible iron ruler under his arm. I had to open the door and go in before everybody. You can imagine how I blushed and how frightened I was. But nothing happened. M. Hamel saw me and said very kindly, Go to your place quickly, little Franz. We were beginning without you. I jumped over the bench and sat down at my desk. Not till then, when I had got a little over my fright, did I see that our teacher had on his beautiful green coat. His frilled shirt and the little black silk cap all embroidered that he never wore except on inspection and prize days. Besides, the whole school seemed so strange and solemn. But the thing that surprised me most was to see on the back benches that were always empty, the village people sitting quietly like ourselves. Old Hosser with his three-cornered hat, the former mayor, the former postmaster and several others besides. Everybody looked sad and Hauser had brought an old primer thumped at the edges and he held it open on his knees with his great spectacles lying across the pages. While I was wondering about it all, M. Hamel mounted his chair and in the same grave gentle tone which he had used to me said, My children, this is the last lesson I shall give you. The order has come from Berlin to teach only German in the schools of Alsace and Lorraine. The new master comes tomorrow. This is your last French lesson. I want you to be very attentive. What a thunderclap these words were to me. Oh, the wretches. That was what they had put up at the town hall. My last French lesson. Why? I hardly knew how to write. I should never learn any more. 
I must stop there then. Oh, how sorry I was for not learning my lessons, for seeking bird's eggs or going sliding on the sar. My books that had seemed such a nuisance a while ago, so heavy to carry, my grammar and my history of the saints were old friends now, and I couldn't give up, and M. Hamel too. The idea that he was going away, that I should never see him again, made me forget all about his ruler and how cranky he was. Poor man. It was in honor of this last lesson that he had put on his fine Sunday clothes. And now I understand why the men of the village were sitting there in the back of the room. It was because they were sorry too that they had not gone to school more. It was their way of thanking our master for his 40 years of faithful service and of showing their respect for the country that was theirs no more. While I was thinking of all these, I heard my name called. It was my turn to recite. What would I not have given to be able to say that dreadful rule for the participle all through, very loud and clear, and without one mistake? But I got mixed up on the first words and stood there, holding on to my desk, my heart beating, and not daring to look up. I heard M. Hamel say to me, I won't scold you, little Franz. You must feel bad enough. See how it is? Every day we have said to ourselves, Bah, I have plenty of time. I'll learn it tomorrow. And now you see? Where we have come out? Ah, that's the great trouble with Alsace. She puts off learning till tomorrow. Now those fellows out there will have the right to say to you, How is it? You pretend to be Frenchmen, and yet you can neither speak nor write your own language. But you're not the worst, poor little Franz. We've all a great deal to reproach ourselves with. Your parents were not anxious enough to have you learn. They preferred to put you to work on a farm at the mills so as to have a little more money. And I? I have been to blame also. Have I not often sent you to water my flowers instead of learning your lessons? And when I wanted to go fishing, did I not just give you a holiday? Then? From one thing to another, M. Hamel went on to talk of the French language, saying that it was the most beautiful language in the world, the clearest, the most logical, that we must guard it among us and never forget it. Because when a people are enslaved, as long as they hold fast to their language, it is as if they had the key to their prison. Then he opened a grammar and read us our lesson. I was amazed to see how well I understood it. All he said seemed so easy, so easy. I think too that I had never listened so carefully and that he had never explained everything with so much patience. It seemed almost as if the poor man wanted to give us all he knew before going away and to put it all into our heads at one stroke. After the grammar, we had a lesson in writing. That day, M. Hamel had new copies for us, written in a beautiful round hand. France, Alsace, France, Alsace. They looked like little flags floating everywhere in the schoolroom hung from the rod at the top of our desk. You ought to have seen how everyone set to work and how quiet it was. The only sound was the scratching of the pens over the paper. Once some beetles flew in, but nobody paid any attention to them. Not even the littlest ones who worked right on tracing their fish hooks as if that was French.
On the roof, the pigeons cooed very low. I thought to myself, will they make them sing in German, even the pigeons? Whenever I looked up from my writing, I saw M. Hamel sitting motionless in his chair and gazing first at one thing, then at another, as if he wanted to fix in his, in his mind just how everything looked in that little schoolroom. Fancy! For forty years he had been there in the same place, with his garden outside the window and his class in front of him. Just like that, only the desks and benches had worn smooth. The walnut trees in the garden were taller, and the hop vine that he had planted himself twined about the windows to the roof. How it must have broken his heart to leave it all, poor man, to hear his sister moving about in the room above, packing their trunks. For they must leave the country next day. But he had the courage to hear every lesson to the very last. After the writing, we had a lesson in history. And then the babies chanted their ba be bi bo bu Down there, at the back of the room, old Hosser had put on his spectacles and holding his primer in both hands, spelled the letters with them. You could see that he too was crying. His voice trembled with emotion and it was so funny to hear him that we all wanted to laugh and cry. Ah, how well I remember that, that last lesson. All at once, the church clock struck twelve, then the Angelus. Angelus means a Catholic prayer said thrice a day. At the same moment, the trumpets of the Prussians returning from drill sounded under our windows. M. Hamel stood up, very pale, in his chair. I never saw him look so tall. My friends, said he, I, I, but something choked him. He could not go on. Then he turned to the blackboard took a piece of chalk and bearing on with all his might, he wrote as large as he could. Vive la France! Then he stopped and leaned his head against the wall and without a word, he made a gesture to us with his hand. School is dismissed. You may go. Here is a quick recapitulation of the story. The story takes place in the period of Franco-German war. It is told from the point of view of little Franz who wouldn't be able to learn his mother tongue from the next day onwards because his motherland has been defeated by enemies. Neither Franz nor the inhabitants of the place he lived showed much interest in learning their mother tongue French until the day their territory was captured by German troops. The Germans forced people of Alsace and Lorraine to learn their language. In order to acknowledge and honor their master, M. Hamel, who served the region for about 40 years, the entire village folk, both old and young, gather in the classroom. They realize the value of their lost language and lost land suddenly. But unfortunately, neither their land nor language was theirs anymore. Here are the value points we can infer from the lesson. One's mother tongue is an expression of one's culture. We should never give it up for any reason. It is unfair that men establish their supremacy over fellow humans and thrust their language, creed and culture. Even animals and birds wouldn't give up their language under any circumstances. Little France wonders ironically 
Will they make sing in German even the pigeons? The core of the lesson is that as long as people hold fast to their language, it is as if they have a key to their prison. So, mother tongue and mother land are as dear to us as our mother herself. Here are some quotes about mother tongue for your reference.